In the year 40 BC, twins would be born to Queen Cleopatra of Egypt and Roman general Mark Antony. One a boy, the other a girl, one named Sun, the other Moon. This is the story of Cleopatra Selene, the Moon Queen of Mauritania. The early life of Cleopatra Selene II was a turbulent one. Her twin brother's full name was Alexander Helios. She had one older half-brother, the only son of Julius Caesar and Queen Cleopatra of Egypt. His name was Caesarion Ptolemy the 15th Caesar. Four years before the birth of the celestial twins, their half-brother's father would be assassinated in Rome on the Ides of March 14th of 44 BC. The twins were born after the queen invited Mark Antony to her capital at Alexandria in 41 BC. On the grounds of a diplomatic mission, they both needed an ally. That they found in each other. And a whole lot more. Antony, like his friend Caesar, would end up spending a lot of time with Cleopatra. He left Alexandria after spending the winter with her. The next fall, she gave birth to their children. Antony had now cheated on the sister of his rival, Octavian. And soon, he would even leave her for the Egyptian queen. Mark Antony for the next two years would be campaigning in Rome as well as around the Levant area. He would return to Cleopatra, Caesarion, and his two twin children in 37 BC. Antony would soon be forced to leave Alexandria again after a short stay. Again, he left the queen pregnant, this time with only a single child. His name was Ptolemy the 16th Philadelphus, and he was born in the summer of 36 BC. In that same year of 36 BC, Antony and Cleopatra would conduct a diplomatic ceremony in Antioch. It would come to be called the Donations of Antioch, and it would grant land to both Antony and Cleopatra. It would even be officially recognized by Octavian back in Rome. Two years after this, a similarly named, but less well received, Donations of Alexandria would take place. In the fall of 34 BC, Cleopatra and Caesarion would receive Egypt. Caesarion was officially named as Julius Caesar's legitimate son. The infant Ptolemy XVI Philadelphus was granted the provinces of Syria, Cilicia, and Phoenicia along the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Alexander Helios was granted Armenia and the Parthian Empire, if his father could ever conquer it. For Cleopatra Selene, she would be granted Cyrenaica and Libya, which at that time was land that was part of Roman Numidia. These donations would all be rejected by Octavian. All but one, that is. The last day of peace between Antony and Octavian would be the last day of 33 BC. Octavian and Mark Antony would go to war in that following year. Later in 31 BC, the fleets of these two men would meet just off the coast of Greece. The battle that ensued, which would become to called Actium, would see the much smaller and more maneuverable boats commanded by Agricola defeat the combined navies of Cleopatra and Mark Antony. The couple would retreat back to Alexandria. Later in 30 BC, the campaigns of Octavian would continue as he invaded Egypt. Mark Antony, having heard of Cleopatra's suicide, killed himself, plunging a gladius into his stomach. However, Cleopatra had not killed herself. Bleeding out Antony was then brought to the queen. He would soon die in her arms. With his death, Cleopatra fulfilled her end of their deal, killing herself with the bite of a poisonous snake on August 10th. This would leave her four children all orphans, and leaving one in immediate and grave danger. Cleopatra Selene's older half-brother Caesarion would flee south, but would return to Alexandria after Octavian sent a letter ensuring his safety. Caesarion would be tricked, arrested, and executed by Octavian. While Octavian knew exactly what to do with Caesarion, the children of Antony and Cleopatra would be a question all in itself. Ptolemy Philadelphus was only six, the twins only ten when they entered into Octavian's captivity. Octavian would return to Rome and be granted a triumph. In the victory parade was the three orphan children in bulky chains that Ptolemy Philadelphus could barely hold up. After this triumph, Alexander Helios and Ptolemy Philadelphus 
are never heard from again. Octavian claims that he did not kill them, but if he did not, then Octavian would be making an out-of-character diplomatic mistake. Personally, I think Octavian either executed or poisoned the sons of his rival, but for some reason, he kept Cleopatra Selene alive. She was now the last Ptolemy. The fate of her dynasty now rested in her hands alone. The Ptolemaic homeland of Egypt would be annexed by the Roman Republic. The orphan Cleopatra Selene would be raised in the same household as her other half-siblings. This would, of course, mean that Cleopatra was now in the care of Octavia, the sister of Octavian, otherwise known as the wife that Mark Antony left in order to be with the Egyptian queen. Imagine that, raising the child of your dead husband's baby that he had while cheating on you. She would grow up in the city of Rome with the protection granted to her by being under the care of Octavian's sister. Cleopatra Selene was near untouchable, when Octavian declared the Roman Empire in January of 27 BC and declared himself emperor and Augustus, Cleopatra Selene's situation would improve even more. She would continue living in Rome, joining the court of the first Roman emperor. By the summer of 27 BC, Selene turned 18. Augustus began looking for a political marriage for this daughter of a rival, turned something of a niece. The last Ptolemy is a wife and the legitimacy that her family name provided would be a gift of great value to any Roman noble or any foreign king. By 25 BC, a marriage had been arranged with Juba II, a king and longtime friend and ally of Augustus. King Juba was someone who Augustus trusted enough to give the power of the entire legacy of the Ptolemaic dynasty and trust him not to use that power against him. Juba had been installed as king of Numidia by Octavian in 30 BC, right before the slaughter of his now wife's family. In case his friend needed any more convincing, Augustus also brought to the wedding a large dowry. Juba II was the son of Juba I, who in 46 BC killed himself. This would result in Numidia being annexed as a province in the Roman Republic for the next 16 years until Juba II came of age. Juba II was only 18 when he came to the throne, and only 23 when he married the 20-year-old Cleopatra Selene. The young couple was set to rule Numidia for a very long time. Except, they didn't. Well, not eastern Numidia, that is. In another shrewd political move by Augustus, he annexes the eastern portion of Numidia into the Roman province of Africa Proconsulares. Just as the emperor seemingly gave Cleopatra Selene the province of Libya, which was promised to her by her father and mother at the donations of Alexandria, he took it away from her, showing who was really in control of the Mediterranean. For western Numidia, Juba and Selene would get to keep that. To repay for the couple's lost land, they were granted the kingship of neighboring Mauritania. Mauritania, since 33 BC, had been incorporated as a Roman province. Now, it was united with West Numidia. The last pieces of North Africa not directly owned by Rome was the Kingdom of Mauritania. Their new capital would be renamed Caesarea, in honor of who else but Julius Caesar. King Juba II allowed his queen much control over Mauritania. The kingdom was hers as much as it was his. Queen Cleopatra Selene went to work on improving Mauritania's economic situation. Although they had more land as monarchs of Mauritania, this new land was less developed and poorly organized. To assist her kingdom, the Moon Queen invited some of the old friends of her mother. Selene invited capable architects, advisors, artists, and diplomats that had once served her mother when she was the Queen of Egypt. If Selene was going to be shoved into the opposite side of Africa from her Egyptian homeland, then she would just bring Egypt to Mauritania. The same people who had helped to build Cleopatra's Egypt would also build the Moon Queen's Mauritania. Their capital of Caesarea had at this point been mostly built in the Roman style. This architecture would remain, but accompanying this architecture was a new style to the region that had not previously been seen. The construction of Egyptian-style temples would start to spring up in Caesarea, as well in the rest of Mauritania. Inside, they would depict the gods of the Romans alongside their Egyptian counterparts. 
On the seafront of Caesarea, a palace similar to the one that she grew up in Egypt was constructed. If this didn't already mark the land as a Ptolemaic monument, then the Queen's next building project certainly would. If you had to connect one building to the Ptolemy dynasty, what would it be? Located in Alexandria, Egypt, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, I am of course talking about the Lighthouse of Alexandria. This ancient lighthouse was reconstructed in the capital of Caesarea. Juba II and Cleopatra Selene's capital, perhaps better than any other city, represented the many cultures of the Mediterranean. Roman, Egyptian, Hellenistic, Punic, and Berber architecture and people could all be found in Caesarea. King Juba II was himself a historian and scholar. It only made sense that he would allow for his queen to reconstruct her Ptolemaic homeland. This would understandably draw a lot of attention to this corner of the Mediterranean. Merchants flocked from all over to have a look at Egypt incarnate. Trade with Italy at their capital of Caesarea flourished. Meanwhile, at the Straits of Gibraltar, trade with Spain found its way into Mauritania. Predominantly, the Mauritanians themselves traded ores, figs, large amounts of grain, ornate furniture, as well as the highly sought after purple dye. Not only did trade prosper under the couple, but so too did exploration. An expedition force gathered, intent on finding land past the Pillars of Hercules. Instead of sticking to the European or African coast, this expedition went straight into the endless Atlantic Ocean. They first made landfall on Madeira. Continuing south, they stumbled upon an archipelago. They made landfall on the largest island called Tenerife. On this island, they found no humans, but only the traces of them. The expedition force stumbled upon a large stone temple, but could not find any of the local Guanche inhabitants. Archaeology shows that the Guanches were already living there, but were probably hiding from the maritime expedition. One thing they did find was man's best friend, the dog. Apparently, the dogs on Tenerife were so vicious and numerous that when King Juba was told, he named the archipelago in honor of them. The Canary Islands, from the Latin canis, which means dog. It is also said that when the power couple reigned in Mauritania, the purity and quality of their coins, both silver and gold, were comparable, and sometimes even better than the Roman ones. In 10 BC, the last Ptolemy, Cleopatra Selene, became one of two Ptolemies. Her son would be born. He would be known as Ptolemy, the future king of Mauritania, and the last Ptolemy monarch ever. But for now, he was just an infant. This baby was joined shortly after his birth by a sister. Her name was likely Drusilla, but no evidence past her own existence has survived. In 7 AD, King Juba II would marry Princess Glyphiria of Cappadocia. Glyphiria had been married to the Prince of Judea, Alexander Herod, but he was executed by his father after a conspiracy. Glyphiria was then sent back to Cappadocia. In 2 AD, King Juba II went on a tour of the Eastern Mediterranean, where he likely met Princess Glyphiria. The two must have hit it off, as by 7 AD they marry, despite Cleopatra Selene still being alive. Juba could have either divorced Cleopatra to marry Glyphiria, or he simply just had two wives. The marriage wouldn't even last a year until Glyphiria left and divorced Juba for her dead husband's brother. This was the only brief interruption over the course of their long reigns. With Cleopatra Selene as the sole queen of Mauritania, the couple lived out a peaceful existence. The Moon Queen's death date is unknown, but coins minted in her honor have been dated to 17 AD, leaving this as the earliest possible date for her death. The latest year that she could have died was 22 AD, as her husband, who died a year later, would outlive the queen. When she died, Juba II had erected a giant monument which would act as their final resting place, called the Royal Mausoleum of Mauritania. It still stands to this day, although the body of Cleopatra Selene is nowhere to be found. In 23 AD, King Juba II would also die, and be buried next to his queen. Succeeding them both would be their son, Ptolemy. The Moon Queen of Mauritania, the far less recognized Queen Cleopatra, represented a lot of different things. For one, she solely represented her Ptolemaic dynasty. With the death of her twin brother, Alexander Helios, the sun had set on the powerful Ptolemies. Now all that remained was the light of the moon. Soon that too, would fade away into darkness.